Well, welcome to BMA Violet Hour. My name is Tracy Beal. I'm the manager of public programs here at the Baltimore Museum of Art. I'm delighted to see so many of you here. I know we're having some funky weather today, so thank you for joining us. Um, as you know, tonight's program is inspired by the exhibition, A Movement in Every Direction, Legacies of the Great Migration. And I'm really happy to say that we have free admission for the exhibition this evening. So after tonight's talk, you can go right out to the left and the exhibition is there so you're free to enter through till 9 p.m. tonight. Um, before I get into introducing tonight's guests, I just want to do a little bit of housekeeping. We're going to have a Q&A at the end of the talk this evening. This talk is being live streamed as well as recorded. So if you do want to ask a question or have a statement that you want to say, just wait for um, someone to pass the mic to you before you actually do that. And so without further ado, let's hear about our first guest. I think a lot of people are familiar with her. So Zoe Charlton. Are we all familiar with Zoe Charlton? Yeah? <laughs> Zoe Charlton creates, and they're clapping back here, it's cute. Zoe Charlton creates works on paper, installations, and animations that depict her subject's relationship to cultural objects and landscapes. Her artist residencies include Art Space in Texas, the McCall Center for Art and Innovation in North Carolina, and the Skohegan School of Painting and Sculpture in Maine. Her exhibitions include Harvey B. Grant Center in North Carolina, Crystal Bridges Museum of American Art in, that's not in Poland, in Arkansas. <laughs> and the Zaheta National Gallery of Art in Poland. She is the co-founder of Kendrick Creative Residencies in Argo Forest in Vermont, and Charlton also holds a seat on the Maryland Arts Council and is a board member for the Washington Project for the Arts in DC. Charlton thrives here in Baltimore, Maryland, and she's a professor she's a professor of art at George Mason University in Fairfax, Virginia. Our second guest is Tequasi Dyson. I think a lot of you are familiar with Tequasi Dyson as well. Her work is one of the first works that you see going into the exhibition, which is quite stunning. Tequasi Dyson received a BFA from the Maryland Commonwealth University in 1999. She has an MFA from Yale School of Art in Painting and Printmaking from 2003. She's working in multi she works in multiple media. Dyson describes herself as a painter whose forms address the continuity of ecology, infrastructure, and architecture. She, she merges ideas such as she merges ideas such as site and built environments, nature and culture under the rubric of environmentalism. Fascinated with transformation, ambiguity, and environmental changes that place these objects in the relationship to each other, her work revolves around investigating our connection to imagination, materiality, geography, and belonging. Our final guest is Jamia Richmond Edwards, coming to us from Detroit. Oh, yes, for the fans, okay. <laughs> Jameer Richmond Edwards creates mixed media collages, utilizing a variety of papers and hand-drawn elements. Her paintings examine the intersection of black and indigenous American history. Richmond, Edward, Richmond Edwards holds a BFA from Jackson State, where she studied painting and drawing, and an MFA from Howard University. She is a recipient of the 2019 Joan Mitchell Painters and Sculptors Award and a 2020 recipient of the Joan Mitchell Art in residency. Jamia has exhibited her work um, nationally as well as internationally. Her work is included in the collections of the Studio Museum in Harlem and the Rubel Family Collection. She currently resides in Detroit with her husband and three children, or three sons to be exact. So finally, moderating tonight's program is Jessica Bell Brown. Jessica Bell Brown is the, cur is the curator for the exhibition that we're all here for tonight. She's also the department head. Are you guys clapping back there? <laughs> She's also the Department Head for Contemporary Art here at the Baltimore Museum of Art, and she's the co-curator for A Movement in Every Direction. And this project, as you know, was um, 
a joint project along with the Mississippi Museum of Art. Her other recent exhibitions here at the BMA include How Do We Know the World, Thaddeus Mosley, Forrest, and Stephanie Sayuko, Vanishing Point Overlay. Prior to joining us here at the BMA, she was a consulting curator for the Gracie Mansion Conservancy in New York. I think I said that wrong. And she holds at the and she held roles at the Museum of Modern Art in New York and Brooklyn Academy of Music and Creative Time. Her writing has been featured in several artist monographs as well as catalogs, and she's been featured in Flash Art, Art Forum. Art Papers, Hyperallergic, and Brooklyn Rail. So if everyone can please just give a very warm welcome to our guests this evening. Thanks again for showing up tonight. Y'all can come out, don't be scared. Come on out. <laughs> and for those of you who don't know, coming out in order, that's Tequasi Dyson, Zoe Charlton, Jamia, and Jesse. Good evening. Good evening. Thanks so much for being here tonight. It's, it's, this is truly um, a highlight of the run of the exhibition to be able to bring Jamia and Torquase back to Baltimore and always to spend more time with Zoe Charlton. So thank you so much for taking the time to chat tonight. This panel is going to be amazing. So I'd like to actually start by asking um, you to take a few moments to, for each of you to introduce yourselves in terms of, you know, how you might share the, the key concerns uh, and questions that guide who you are as an artist. So this is a little different from the bio, but just what's driving you in your query as an artist? Testing, hello. <laughs> um, so I'll start first. Um, so for me, I my work is really driven by my interest of unpacking who I am, what I am, where I'm from. Um, over the past couple of years, my work has featured self-portraiture. And so I, as I'm like really beginning to examine my work, I'm like, this is literally art therapy. Um, you guys are witnessing me learning and unlearning and so, yeah, my work is really about understanding my truth and being able to stand up in my truth. And um, my truths are rooted in my imagination, it's rooted in ancestry, it's rooted in the landscape of this country. So, um, so yeah, that's, that's mine. Well, um, so I make a lot of different kinds of work, and, but I'm primarily a drawer, and I always say that I'm the most conventional figurative drawer there ever can be. Somebody comes into my studio and stands there and I draw them. But I also make these animations and installations and I work collaboratively. And so my concerns really are the relationships between an object and a landscape and a body and I'm invested in the narrative potential of a body, and particularly my body or black women's bodies, and what that has to say about um, access, oppression, uh, history, uh, the very challenging kinds of relationships that we have with each other and the spaces that we inhabit. Thank you, Jessica, for the question. Um, I, I'm learning that I'm interested in making objects that are built to welcome um, experiences um, for black and brown people in particular. So I, as I learn from these more recent works, what I understand my intention is to make these compositions at the edge of my imagination or at the edge of my engineering capacity or at the edge of my compositional capacity that operates to welcome and challenge the body and to um, think about new ways 
the body moves through spaces and how the body might move through space in the future. Um, so I think that's what my work is about mm -hmm. in this moment. Mm -hmm. My concerns, movement. Thank you so much for um, answering this question so thoughtfully and I think giving us um, as, a, as a collective um, an opportunity to be grounded in, in your work. Um, and I asked you that question because I also wanted you to think about how who you are as an artist um, is enveloped in the work that you produced for this exhibition, A Movement in Every Direction, Legacies of the Great Migration. Um, and, you know, f I think the audience has, you know, sees the finished product, but we have built you know, an extended dialogue and community over the course of, the, you know, the past two years um, in the making of this project. Um, but I thought it would be kind of interesting and fun and insightful to think about that earliest moment when you received uh, a call from me and Ryan and we were like, will you be in our show, please? <laughs> and I wanted you to think about how you imagined um, or what you imagined uh, to, for yourself and to create for yourself for this project. Um, so I'll leave it there. And I, I'm so curious to see how, how you'll enter into this, this question. Well, for me, <laughs> it was very serendipitous um, because by the time I had received the call, I've been researching my family's genealogy um, for the past five years, obsessively. So anyone who knows me personally, they know this is, I'm just like, yo, look, look what I discovered. Um, and what's been so uh, really fascinating about this genealogical journey is there's been so many unexpected discoveries um, that really shifted how I understand myself, how I understand this country. Um, so it's, I was at that point really, really interrogating just a lot of my understandings and a lot of my education and history in general. So by the time I received the call, I'm just like, wait a minute, okay, universe. Um, <laughs> this is really, it really presented a challenge for me to root myself in my understanding. So, um, so yeah, I, it was, it was perfect and the challenge for me was like, okay, I have all of this data, all this information, I have binders, just forensic research, and it was how do I encapsulate everything? How do I tell such rich, unexpected, you know, so many unexpected, um, um, like, details and nuances that, you know, a lot of people don't know about their families, and here I am with this um, this gold mine. So it was it was a perfect timing for me. Mm -hmm. I want to return to this in a few moments um, and dive a little deeper into what, how you were working working through that discovery of you and also this unpacking of your family history. So we're going to come back to that. But Zoe, what was how did you feel when Ryan and I begged you to be in our show. <laughs> and uh, how, how does who you are or who you were then fold into? Well, first what I you was made. excited. I'm just very honored to have been invited by y'all. Um, but, you know, quite frankly, I was a little bit confused because I thought, <laughs> I wonder what, what are y'all looking for? Mm -hmm. and, um, and it was probably about a good month in or two months in when I called you both and I said, hold on, I make drawings. Do you have the space for a large drawing? Um, or did you want an animation? Or did you want a sculpture? So I wasn't really sure what to do. But the thing that I was most excited about, which I never have an opportunity to do, is to sit and think. And so just the... Um, the opportunity to be supported for a year and make work and think about work allowed me to do a handful of things. Number one, 
engage in a, a certain kind of research that I typically don't have time to do with resources where I could ask other people whose areas of expertise were about that work um, and work with people in the community that um, could help me actually make something bigger than anything I could make by myself. And so with that in mind, um, we met, we talked probably, you, you, me, and Ryan talked like every couple of months. And, um, and it was very helpful to help me shape the idea for this large piece. Um, but what I started to recognize is that I had holes in my own knowledge and even holes in the way that I would go about finding that knowledge. And so I um, called Dr. Jeffrey Hayes, who is the executive director of Three Walls, because I knew that her area of research is black military life. And so we worked together uh, twice a month um, in gathering that research. I also knew that I needed help figuring out how to make a construction. And from our conversations about this pop-up, um, I was out of my league. I originally wanted a big paper pop-up house like that, which there was a kind of impossibility. And I remembered you, you said, that's a great idea, but. <laughs> and so it gave me the, the um, time and the resources to call Lu Zhang. And if you guys don't know Lu Zhang, you should know who she is. She is honestly the shit in Baltimore. And it was an opportunity to work with Lou to figure out how to make this construction come to life. Um, and I was able to also um, call on people who um, I knew could uh, help me realize something. And that was this, and that was Malcolm Major of Major Studios. And I really um, was very honored to be able to work with him. And he uh, turned things around so quickly for me. Um, but it just gave me the space to talk about these ideas with people that I've been wanting to talk with for a long time about the um, spaces, uh, about the parts of this work that um, I found truly confusing. And so this work gave me the space to be confused, to not know, to be challenged and um, to really struggle in, in some of the most, the best kind of ways. Um, and also this work would not have been done without like a whole team of people putting this together. And so um, this work is ambitious because my community um, gave me the space to be ambitious and supported me in doing that. Thank you, Zoe. There's something about um, ab about the ways in which um, being an artist allows you to be in constant community with folks, and sometimes it's your family, sometimes it's co other collaborators, friends, you know, scholars, etc. Um, so I definitely want to want to return to that um, further into the conversation. And Torquase, I also want to take the opportunity to refine my question for you too before you answer because I think so much of what Zoe is describing is what I've observed in the three of you, just the sort of sweeps, uh, sort of massive sort of uh, jumps in scale and ambition. And, um, and I'm wondering for you, like how, if, if you might want to share with us um, you know, what, when you look at your work now, the work that you made for the show way over there inside me, the journey from the first conversation to then. So <clears throat> I love telling the story because it is about curators who support, provide infrastructure, and give you space to think, but also challenge you and have, um, I think, righteous expectations. So when uh, you and Ryan, of course, approached me about the show, I was so happy to be in dialogue. I thought the show was discursive. 
fantastic. I came to you all with my first proposal. And it's that thing where we're on Zoom, right? <laughs> I screen share and I share my first idea. And I can just see Jessica's face go. <laughs> it was like her and Ryan were so confused. <laughs> and I was immediately, you know, I was, oh my God, what, what's going on? What did I do? Is it too, you know, is it too something, right? Because when you're working with people where you have long-term respect, you trust that something is not right. Um, and so in that conversation, I was making something modular, something that could um, contract, right? Something that could spread out and sort of tuck in itself. And it was much smaller, uh, much more compact. It was a, a sculpture of immediacy and that expanse. And they were able to communicate to me that they wanted me to go far, right? They want, and was curious about what I would do in this relationship with space and distance and sort of gave me that permission. Um, and then I went back and worked really hard on something that, again, that would allow me to take my own brain and thinking about space and form um, to a sort of end point. Like, how do you exercise your expression um, and exhaust the possibilities of expression within the context of the language that you work with? And this is what that show mm -hmm. allowed me to do. It allowed me to take... And that's the first time I had done it, to take it to a point where I know I could not have gone further. This was the end of my capabilities. And um, that's, where, that's what it means to work in this space with you and Ryan, that you pushed me to push my capacities mm -hmm. to the further. I um, so appreciate you sharing this <laughs> in this way. Um, and I, you know, I feel like it, the relationship between curators and artists, you know, it's such a dance. And um, I think it's also hard to know when there's, well, I should rephrase this. I think sometimes there's not trust in the space to be able to not have a poker face, right? And that respect, um, deep respect, I think, allows for like um, a, a portal into saying, I don't, we don't want you to constrict, we want you to expand. We were having a conversation before, the, um, before uh, tonight's event about, um, you know, the ways in which we, I think, and I think sometimes as women apologize or make ourselves smaller. Um, and Ryan and I, we were very adamant about saying, no, 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 what would you do with no limitations? You know, what, what, what is, how would you hold that space or fill that space? So, yeah. <laughs> Torquaze was like, what? <laughs> and Ryan and I were like, oh yeah, we got to, no, we want you to do it big. And I think the three of you really, you know, succeeded in, um, you know, in stepping up into that, that, that much larger expanse, you know, so beautifully. So, you know, the premise of our, of our, of our show is um, deeply rooted in personal storytelling, right? And I think part of that, um, the ways in which we were interested in entering into these different conversations about the great migration was that, you know, at the end of the day, we wanted it to be driven by you, your voices, your experiences, your stories, and for you to set those parameters. And I'm just curious if you might want to share with us, like, why do you think the great migration is a subject that has captivated us so much as a society. Um, and I think I'm speaking from a black lens here um, because not, it's not a history that I think is widely taught um, in schools and universities, but it's one that we know so deeply and intimately. Um, 
Who wants to take that one on? I'm really happy to read that question and wanted to really specifically evoke Horton Spiller's work in the crisis of the Negro intellectual and this idea that <clears throat> you know movement and imagination between the this this idea of body space geography freedom you know post colonization in the well in the belly of colonization and then the sort of racial atmosphere um, be, um, in the continuation of the, 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 the sort of middle passage, it's like these things are all about movement in every direction, right? Well, it, it was the expansion of the colonies, the condition of the middle passage, the creation of traditions of freedom, all of these, um, are in relationship to both science and culture. Or movement as a science, movement as a culture. And I don't think in any way that we'll ever stop moving um, in liberation strategies, both in real time and with our imaginations because of the conditions in which we're made, because of our identities and because of the way we've built consciousness around movement in relationship to freedom. So it's, I don't think it's something that can be exhausted. And I think what then puts it in the catalyst of today is of course climate change and climate migration and how that's happening all over the world. Um, so I think it's palpable, I think it's ongoing and I, I think it's always the right time to think about um, different registers of migration. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I appreciate everything that you said, Turquoise. Um, these kinds of conversations, one of the reasons why we never get tired of them, I don't get tired of them, is that um, the Great Migration exemplifies um, a thread and extremes at both threads. And one is about fugitivity, and the other end is about opportunity. And within my own family, Fugitivity and opportunity were the reasons why people either left or stayed where they were. And um, just before the, um, the panel, I was having a long conversation with one of my first cousins who is in their 70s. And, um, and uh, I asked him why did his family move to Miami as opposed to going north, and I had another aunt that went to Pennsylvania where my uncle worked in the coal mines. And so in both cases, those aunts moved for opportunity. And then I had a number of cousins that left the South because of fugitivity, right? They needed to escape from where they were for a lot of different kinds of reasons, reasons that range from um, escaping family life or, um, or, uh, or state life, you know, um, um, or even just being a fugitive from self, right? And then that led to an opportunity for reinvention of self. And in my, um, in my own family, uh, my more immediate family, um, the Great Migration holds um, such residents because um, my uncles and my dad chose to uh, leave beyond the states um, for opportunity. They were in the military and felt that military life was the only way that they could gain access to all the other things, you know, this American life, right? And so, um, I really do as well appreciate that question um, because it's hard to talk about both of those because it, in each instance, uh, it makes, makes me and makes one reflect on who is being left behind or what they're being left behind. I love that response. I'm just thinking about um, how reframing the Great Migration as this um, prolonged um, exercise in 
asserting agency, even in the most dire circumstances, was something that, you know, we were, I think, trying to tackle together. You know, like how do you, what, what new, what can we say about the Great Migration anew? How can we build on what we already know or what we think we know about the, the most transformative argument, arguably the most transformative um, um, phenomena in the 20th century, in the long 20th century? Jamia, what are your thoughts? Yeah, for me, um, the Great Migration was really shrouded in mystery and to be honest, my understanding of it was really from school. And um, what this process has really encouraged me was to like do something that is really important and is to talk to our family, to talk to our elders, to ask questions, to, to get an understanding. Um, for me, what's really important, so I have a background in education as well, um, secondary education did it for 13 years, and oftentimes, like, I, I graduated from high school in 2000, and, you know, what's important for me is what is the millennials' perspective of the Great Migration, right? Um, how, and I, it, it was really important for me to begin to, like, really contextualize what that not only mean for my family, but for, you know, black people as a whole. Um, so as I'm working through this question, um, these questions with my family, again, it's, a, it's, a, it's so much nuance. It's so much nuance in these conversations. And a lot of times um, when our history is historicized, is like it's painted as if we're like this um, monolith. And that's absolutely not the case. Um, so for me, this was, um, I wanted to make sure that um, I, in my depiction of it, that it's colorful, it's, it's, it's very contemporary. I mean, obviously I'm a contemporary artist, um, but I, it's important for me, to, for young people to see it and to begin like, you know what? I wonder what's my family's, um, how my family story revolves around this moment in history. Um, so yeah, it's it sparked a new interest. For me, it was, I was really, not dismissive of it, but a lot of times when we are learning about history as a black indigenous American, we don't really know the details. Like you hear of like, you know, the Civil War, the Great Migration, and it's a lot of details and things that happen in between there. Um, that I'm just like, yeah, we need, to, we need to know that to help contextualize and understand. And one of the things that was really cur that had me curious is like, how did two million, like half of the Southern population lead? Like, how, how did that happen? It wasn't Twitter. <laughs> like, all right, y'all, jobs popping over here. So I'm really interested in like the engineering of it, so right? Yeah. And from having these conversations, um, you know, I started having conversations with friends and they were saying like, yeah, you know, people were hearing about jobs and opportunities and I'm like, oh, okay. So this is a very cyclical thing because there's, you know, I'm, I, my, I was migrating, actively migrating as I was making this work. So to dis demystify it some, um, it's just like, oh, this is, this is a, a story about people needing better opportunities, right? Mm -hmm. um, you were talking, when we first, um, one of the earliest conversations that we had was about, um, you know, the, per, the perception of opportunity in the North and the ways in which the Great Migration set your family, kind of bifurcated its destinies. Yes. In unexpected ways, I think. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think how I observe the narrative is like, okay, you have the big bad South, then we went up North and we just freedom time, yay, right? And it's like, mm, actually, what happened when we migrated? You had the interstate projects that disrupted our communities. You had the crack epidemic, you had the heroin epidemic. You had all this blight and so it's, it's like, well, what did we run away from and where do we go to? 
And it's also this conversation about land ownership. And if you like just want to Google, it's millions of acres of black land ownership. It's just, it, it disappeared. So these are, these open, when you begin to really unpack it, it's open up more questions. And like then, as Ms. Carrie Mae Weems said, now we just open up the floor for reparations. Like what, you know, because this is very recent. This is very recent history and what that looks like. So, um, so yeah, I'm the, I'm the person who's just like, okay, yeah, we came, my family, we moved to Detroit. And it's like, oh, we lost hundreds of acres of land. Was that the best thing, you know? What, what was that all about? So Jamia's painting, which is a detail of which is behind us, this water runs deep. I'll run back to it um, here. Um, is takes the sort of tragedy of the 1927 Mississippi River flood from which Jamia's um, family was displaced in the Delta um, and had to basically seek shelter west, further and further west of the Mississippi. Um, and so I think this unexpected narrative or under, I think underrepresented narrative around ecological disaster, natural disaster and displacement and the ways in which um, that also becomes an opportunity for um, furthered oppression. Um, you know, you are highlighting that then, but also thinking about the vitality and, you know, of, re of the resilience that was needed to get through it. Um, Zoe, I'm interested in talking about the vantage point that you shared in your work, in thinking about the military as a space um, for movement and migration, and wondered, you know, I think, I think your proposition was was so mind-boggling, and also so deeply familiar, right? Like black military participation, social uplift, um, and then the kind of being caught in the crossfires of um, imperial ambition coming home, having more resources than you had before, but less opportunity. I wonder if you could share, unpack with us more about, um, I think the, un the unique perspective that you're also bringing to this conversation around movement. So the uh, initially, I mean, it's funny to think about the, the original idea for this work. And it was originally only going to be the drawing and then it was going to be the drawing and then a large house and then this pop-up and then it got scaled back again. And, um, and the, the prompt for me was, what are signs of American imperialism in, on other soil, right? And I really started thinking about um, the land, right, the landscape not the land, but the landscape, and, um, and the evidence of military in, on, in those lands. And I really started, I was really thinking about the kind of scar that's left by um, decommissioned bases. Uh, the base that my dad retired from in northern Maine is now a nature preserve. Uh, and uh, a few years ago, my spouse and I went up there and you can still see all the military housing. You can see all the trucks still there, which is surprising. It's been, what, over 20 years. Um, and when I look at satellite photos of other decommissioned bases in other countries like Vietnam, et cetera, you can still see this scar in the land. And so originally that 18 foot drawing really was about the valley and um, imagining if a base were in that valley. And it started to turn into something else. It started to turn into, well, what are some other ways that, um, uh, what are some other signs of military in a landscape? And I started thinking about places like, uh, uh, like Levittown, 
Mm -hmm. right? And, and who Can Levittown? you share more about Levittown? Well, you know, Levittown, there's two. There's what, one in Pennsylvania, one in New York. And it was really a, a place that was made for uh, people coming back from the military to live, right? To start their life anew. And it was for white people. And, um, and black folks weren't supposed to be ever living in Levittown. I am a military dependent. All I know are military bases, military bases and suburbia, right? Military bases remind me of suburbia. And so my idea of where I should live even now has everything to do with that history, which is intimately tied to spaces like Levittown, places like Levittown, which I find really interesting just to, as a thought process, right? Um, you know, if we start thinking about the ways that our, our um, tastes, right, our thinking, our education, et cetera, are part of a colonized system, right? I have to reflect on those kinds of things. And so um, in this piece, uh, there are bits of Levittown that, are, um, that have popped up in this Vietnamese countryside, right, amongst rice fields. And there is a woman on the far left of the drawing who is throwing a, um, a plane. It's a kind of fighter plane um, that was flown towards the, I think at the, the very end of World War II and, and primarily through Vietnam, the Vietnam conflict or war. And, um, and she's tossing it into the valley where Levittown is. And there are moments where I feel like we have to, in order to dismantle all of this, we have to like take it all down. But at the same time, I'm thinking that, I think, well, that's a part of my history. That's a part of how I understand myself and how I like to live and et cetera. So am I really gonna burn it all down, you know? And so it's a very complicated and nuanced conversation that I'm having with myself. At the same time, there's this backdrop it actually is a backdrop that is surrounded by these, the Spanish moss, and it becomes a vignette. It becomes some place to move into. Um, and you're moving into it, or I'm moving into it, from the things that are in the front, which is this pop-up of this house. And the pop-up of the house is actually my grandmother's house. And this around, that's surrounded by this landscape, this wooded area. Mm -hmm. And so what I'm working with is something that's real in space that is stitched together or collaged together from a lot of different parts. Um, and some parts of it are things that are already found, right? That's the, sometimes that's the way that we uh, organize our life from the things that already exist to things that are hand created like that house is hand-drawn and hand-painted, but there are things that are ours that we create, right, that become a part of that bigger collage that is in, in front of a backdrop that seems to be aspirational, but it might not be aspirational. Mm -hmm. And so this whole piece called Permanent Change of Station is really about a kind of impermanence, right? And it's about this, the scar of expectations the scar of American imperialism, the scar of hope, and a scar of opportunity. And so uh, this piece is really resonant for me because I think it encapsulates um, a lot of the ways that I've been thinking or internalizing um, notions of self and origin. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, you know. It, I really appreciated that question because even in the way that I was writing out my responses, I was like, well, tch, I should just go back to school <laughs> because <laughs> <laughs> I could write for days on this. Yeah. But yeah, um, it was a, it was, um, it's still a wonderful exercise for me to uh, sort of go through to um, really find those holes and the nuances and mm -hmm. how I want to work with them, 
Right. I'm thinking a lot about home, not as a place, but as a condition. And um, I think that kind of permanence of um, that kind of cyclical nature of military life is also a metaphor for, um, or maybe I find, um, I, f I find connection in how Torquase was describing this kind of permanent condition of movement for black folks and, and sort of moving in and out of, or, or imagining uh, an alternative possibility to displacement. I wonder if you have anything to share Torquase in response to that or to Jamia or, Tor or Zoe in, in their answers to this question, like, because I no saw idea. you over there like, oof, you know? Yes. So let's, let's bring it back to, to a thread that you wanted to jump into. Yeah, I, I think that both comments are, have to do with questions of distance, right? Distance and moving and Ronaldo's work on the long emancipation. Like, what does it mean to understand a continued liberation strategy that morphs both in the micro scale, the meso scale, and the macro scale. And then the systems that either you self-produce to catapult the quotidian into freedom, or conditions that you self-produce to catapult the phenomenological into freedom. But both in this idea of, again, the colonies, expansions, dispossession, Modernism and its catastrophe set all of this sort of, you know, not only capital, racial capitalism into play, right? And as soon as these bodies, our bodies, our ancestral bodies were materialized, right, then genocide becomes the way of the day of movement, right? So what does it mean to continue to refuse the catastrophe of a kind of system that continuously tells us that we have no consciousness. And this is Saidiya's work and this idea of pointing out that all of these histories of slavery, middle passage, colonization, all of this is creating in its systems an oppositional consciousness, right? That it's not, it doesn't make sense, right, for us to be on the coffle laughing be on the um, auction block laughing and smiling. That's a condition of oppositional consciousness. So when so-called emancipation happens and then so-called conditions of abolition happens and then people become abolitionists and we understand as an abolitionist, you understand that the emancipation is ongoing. Mm -hmm. So with both categories of both the sort of local, hyper-local capitalism and the catastrophe of capital and environmental catastrophes, it must be an ongoing tradition of liberatory practices, right? Um, and God knows that the military and its abuse of natural resources, right? And ideas of land grabbing and redlining and moving both north, east, west, and south, right? On land that's, that's still in conditions of the dispossessed. I just wanna say this ecosystem of thought Right, is why this show, I think, is so palpable. Mm -hmm. Because all of it's true and all of it's ongoing, right? I know, I just want to sit with that for a second. I know we have to move into Q&A in just a few short minutes. Um, but I think that you've struck a chord in how we honor the complexity of this history that contains many histories within it, right? Um, that we're still reckoning with and, and um, working through. And I wonder if maybe we can, I don't wanna say end, but maybe suspend, um, suspend us in this moment to kind of talk through, you know, how can we, I feel like your works, the, the three of you sit in this liminal or between kind of space. And that to me is the most fertile space because it's a space of irres irresolution, um, which is the great migration 
you know. Um, I wonder how this question of liminality um, met with the kind of hard um, facts of dispossession and the hard facts of like, of, of this ability to conjure anew and to imagine anew and to, to, to move through, right? Like all of those, I think, sensibilities and modalities are deeply, deeply embedded in your works. And I wonder if you might wanna share some closing thoughts about how engagement in those modes um, shows up in your work as an artist? Um, for me, the space that I'm interested in occupying when we're speaking in terms of like liminal spaces is even from a conceptual standpoint. And I'm, I'm interested in that space right outside of reality that rests in like the fantasy and mythos. And I've been there, which is why if, you know, in this piece for the show, I included a dragon. Um, over the past year, I've been really riding that, that, that wave. And what it has allowed me to do is, is to really latch on to like the metaphor of the dragon. Because if we're talking about, you know, we understand that this is impermanence, we understand that there, this is the reality we live in, right? It's nothing, you know, it is what it is. Um, but how do you overcome that? And for me, what that looks like is evoking the spirit of a dragon. You know, the dragon is this, you know, this mythological, this unknown beast or being, and is it real or is it not? And for me, it's like, it's really allegorical to my experience as a black person, you know? of not understand, like no, not fully knowing what I am. And it's like, oh yeah, this is my reality. This is my existence. Like why, why me? But taking on the spirit of the dragon, right? Of the unicorn has really um, allowed me to find peace and adventure within this American um, experience. And so, um, and even with me even attaching to the dragon or the serpent, I've been able to find the dragon and a serpent within the landscape of America. The Mississippi River is mm -hmm. a serpent, it's a dragon. We have Serpent Mound in Ohio. So it's something really special about mythology and even looking at ancient peoples, how they identified and understood their um, the world and their being with, you know, metaphor. So, um, yeah, I'm really, I like that space. Mm -hmm. I haven't, I've, I've, his, I've only been in this space the past year, but I can say that I've learned more about myself with just researching dragons. <laughs> and just to give you like a real quick, um, one of the things I discovered about dragons and reading these books is that dragons communicate by rhyming, they communicate by rhyming. So even, <laughs> how do black folks, we rhyme, we spit and you know. So even me to even like attach on to that mythos of the dragon, this, you know, the dragon is one of the most powerful things in the universe and, and it, it's like, we're gonna be okay. So that's my, that's my space, that's our space and I'm saying that's our space um, because we tend to, there's this, I think there's a concerted effort to minimize um, our footprints and the reality is you're everywhere. You're, you're everywhere on this land and even above the land, inside of the land, inside of the, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if that, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. yeah, okay. <laughs> Um, yes. <laughs> um, so, I, I exist in a lot of in-between spaces. And so it's really, um, 
it's a it, that's a, a a challenging thing for me to answer mm -hmm. only because of that but I think it's in those spaces that I find the most freeing and I find, and it's interesting because Turquoise, when you were talking about liberation, I was like, well, that's the liminal space. That is actually the place where I find the most opportunity, the most space for reinvention, right? Or even just invention or becoming of myself. And it just makes me think about uh, the things that I do that lead to liberation are always the things that are about being in the process, going towards something, um, being in between something. And so uh, I found that really powerful and resonant and it actually makes me really excited to, to um, name that liminal space a liberatory space, um, which is very different from freedom. Right, and um, because it's something that doesn't stop, right? Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, so I appreciate those comments and, um, and a way to expand um, and affirm um, being in the in-between and, um, and for whatever reasons, feeling comfortable in that in-between is I, I love that thoughtful. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about that. Yes. Um, yes. The in between, the liminal. Yeah. Um, what was I going to say? I read that question. Oh, I wanted to talk about um, Stokely Carmichael, Kwame Ture, um, from the islands to the Bronx to um, as a freedom fighter. Right, and let's just talk about the liminal space of the freedom fighters, right? And the people who that we are of. Um, and that migration movement is of the methodology of freedom fighters, right? And so as I think about um, this work and movement and liberation strategies and, and engineering and communication and the haptic in relationship to the modern and the industrial. Um, what I think about um, and how this piece has led me to Kwame Ture is to think about black power as a black democracy, like real democracy. And the reason he found himself in Lowndes County working with SNCC is to fight for black power, right? And the reason B before um, even the Black Panther Party expanded into what we know it to be now, that the, the, the sign itself, the image itself, just to tap into what it means to think about imagery and representation and ideas and imaginations of freedom, that is the black tradition, right? So we, we think about the Black Panther as an emblem of freedom and black democracy as a condition of then the vote. Um, and the power of movement and force and velocity, all of that is wrapped up into what it means to still be under the condition of emancipation, right? So when I think about um, how I got to this piece, I had done a couple pieces in relationship to ideas of distance, distance is power, distance, you know, a lot of oftentimes running from white folks trying to put distance between you and the violence mm -hmm. of whiteness. Mm -hmm. um, so I titled one piece, I Belong to the Distance, because I believe um, that condition of movement and liminality is absolutely a face of liberation. And it also is a space where we can register different kinds of movement, whether the movement is a kind of stillness as you move through a space, or a movement is a run or a train, that understanding liberation and movement at different registers, I think also is a kind of, yeah, you know, it's the genius of the dispossessed to know when that movement has to happen at a stealth level or that movement has to happen, you know, at a level of a train or a level of mass in, in silence. So I'm, I'm interested in that 
the capability, you know, of articulating the power of movement as a condition of a postmodern, you know, reality, right? Or a decolonized reality is the freedom of movement and the de, um, decriminalization of movement and being able to go where you want and breathe in clean air and drink clean water, right? And let um, and have a real historical relationship with um, indigeneity and its relationship to movement, right? And nomadicity. So that's what that piece for me is an arc of learning the relationship between modernism, what does it mean, seriality, what does it mean to have agency within these built vernaculars of oppression and to move through them and triumph, right, and last and belong to a certain distance of black life form. Does that make sense? And when that movement has to be collective movement versus our own individual, right, um, yeah. I love that move in triumph. <laughs> Couldn't have said that more beautifully um, or powerfully. So I think we have time for a couple of questions. So Sabina, wave Sabina if you can so folks can see you. If you have a question, she'll find you. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Hope. Should I stand? <laughs> Thank you for coming and sharing your work with us. Um, so I wrote this down so I didn't forget. Um, all of your work demands attention and takes up space to share a story that is deeply personal to you and your history. My question is, and forgive me if this is like too personal, how do each of you take up space and feel present in your personal lives, and how does that influence your practice? <laughs> I love it. I love it. I'll say um, my one of the things that I'm practicing now is space and consciousness, right? In this sort of on in the ecosystem of all of my community in the battle of this long emancipation condition. Really, the way I take up space is to um, deal with my mind personally. This is your question personally, right? Personally, is to deal with mind, thought, and consciousness, non attachment, acute awareness, and know that my gray matter, my brain, is a machine in itself, and that I have to um, condition it, right, to be ready and alert to acute liberation, right? So it, you know, capitalism and all these kind of conditions scrambles consciousness. So my space in practice right now is to gain space in my thoughts and being so that I can be aware of acute moments of liberation. Does that make sense? Pers personally, that doesn't necessarily make its way into my art all the time, but as a personal human being, you know. I love that response. <laughs> I just loved it. Yeah, right? Pers personally, I loved it too. Um, I, that's, that's a really beautiful question. Um, and, you know, often in these talks, we don't have that space for this kind of intimacy. So thank you so much for doing that. Um, I'm 60 inches tall. And I tend to think that I don't take up any space. Thank you. That's right, five footers in the house. Yes. Um, <laughs> And I tend to think that I don't take up a lot of space, but according to my colleagues and my friends, that I do. And one of the ways that uh, I intentionally take up space in my personal life is the way that I connect the different things that I do together. And so my studio is one thing, but I have a politic and a value system that I need to be in the forefront um, of all the decisions that I make. And so I take up space by being involved on committees and 
on boards um, because I want my thinking to take up space. Um, I want uh, my politic to take up space and I need my relationships, especially the ones that overlap, to be bigger and louder than what I can do by myself. And I, that directly relates to the work that I do in this work here, you know, but it's not about the content of the work, but it's in the making of it. And so, um, because I recognize that collective work is core to how I understand myself and how I can move things that are important to me forward. Um, the only ways that I can amplify that is by um, overlapping with someone else. And so um, for that reason, you know, I understand that um, I'm probably about six feet tall, right? Because of it. And that is with intention. Whew, that's a really good question. Um, so for me, even as a young child, um, up into the present, I've, I'm quiet. And um, the reason why I, I live in my head, I've always historically lived in my head, and I've always had that feeling like, if I, Jamia, you are so crazy, like people are never gonna understand you. You know, like I, I, I live in the abstract. I live in the fantasy. So um, art has always been that, that, um, that vehicle for me. It has always been that vehicle for me. And so as I'm becoming more comfortable in my personhood, I'm, the, the art is becoming like larger, it's becoming louder, right? Um, and I, I allow my ideas to live in that vein. Also, as a mother, like I'm also, I'm a, I have three amazing sons, a beautiful husband. And part of my taking up space is empowering them and allowing them to see me actualize my ideas, actualize my dreams. They are an extension of me, my progeny. So them moving in the world and their knowing and then being comfortable and knowing thyself is enabling me to, to enable them to take up space. It's allowing my ancestors, you know, I'm, we, are, we are our ancestors, right? Um, so although at, at, as a 40 year old woman, I don't have to talk as loud. I don't have to, I, like, I don't have to make a scene, but me being able to feel beautiful in my body and my hair and my ideas, like I'm, I'm comfortable with being, with not being so loud, you know. It, it, yeah, I'm, I'm making sense, it's cool. Um, Cause I can go way off, so I'm like, Jamia, stay focused. Um, so, so I think as women, as black women, it, you know, just even how we are allowed to, how we dress because we're conditioned to bridle ourselves, to not be so loud, to not be so. And I discovered that, you know, my, me being quiet is also a fear. And I've just given myself permission, like, okay, you know, we live also in a world that's like, you know, you have to be politically correct. You can't say, you can't do as much, but that's why the art becomes so important. And I feel like, um, I realized like artists are really superheroes because we have the language and tools to say things that a lot of people can't say. So, um, so I'm, I'm just like, I'm taking up the most space in the work and you know, this is my mentee as well. And part of me taking up space is empowering you and your sister to be able to like express yourself, right? And just, and even like, as I say that, like that is, that should be something that we all are able to do to take up space and how, as, as we have these conversations, it's just like, well, yeah, we should be able to articulate and express ourselves, you know? And so it's just really, um, it's just really emphasize how special and important this space is 
um, me being an artist is. So. Hello. First off, just thank you all for an amazing talk. Um, I wrote down so many questions, but I, I got to stick to one, obviously. Um, just looking at you all's work, and I can't wait to be in, in the space and absorb, you know, absorb what, what all that feels like. Um, I'm thinking about the ways in which your works articulate a kind of uh, evolution of the black imaginary um, and ways in which uh, they take up space. You all mentioned phenomenologically, existentially, of course. I, I see it all. I, I feel it all. Um, I'm wondering if you all could tell me in your own way uh, ways in which the black imaginary and uh, the way in which it articulates a kind of magical process that is very real. Um, at one point, the black imaginary was just conceptions of freedom, where that was just an imaginary idea for us. And the way in which the black imagination, when it's articulated in a certain kind of way, shakes the world and, and changes the world. And the ways in which across the Atlantic, their um, black, brown, European folks are looking at us and waiting for us to articulate our black imaginary in a kind of way. What does um, the black imaginary mean for each of you um, in these ways of, decon of decolonization, these ways of articulating liberation? You know, one of the things that really helped uh, pull it out of me is it's really this exhibition and doing a genealogy because one of the things that I discovered is that Jamia Richmond Edwards and land and America, there's, it's inseparable. I think oftentimes we, um, we remove ourselves from this land and the history of this land so, um, really quick, I discovered in Georgia, where my family is from, Macon, there are step pyramids there. It's pyramids all over this country, ancient mounds. Um, and just relocating back to Detroit, I'm looking at the architecture there, which is similar here in Baltimore, and as I'm, I realized as I began, re, began researching more and understanding myself and my family in relationship to America, the world, I'm noticing things now. And one of the things I noticed was like there's dragons and unicorns in all of this architecture everywhere, right? So even, so as I'm beginning to look at the architecture, I'm also looking at the sculptures, the figure, the figures within this sculpture and a lot of them look like me. So what that, what that means is you have what I'm calling this old world architecture. You have these amazing miles and pyramids that we can't have that conversation without me and my ancestry, which is a little clouded, but I, under, I know that it's there. So the black imagination is infinite. It has always existed. This, we wouldn't be here today if it wasn't. So. I think part of my job and what I want to encourage is to remove that construct of like, it's bigger than black imagination. Like it's, it's like black matter imagination. It's the ethers, it's the, you know, and I think oftentimes we separate ourselves from the ether. If you study what melanin is, it's literally like stardust, literally. No cap, it's stardust. So what that means for me is, is like, there, are, there isn't any capacity to what, I just have to have the gumption and courage to imagine, right? So, um, so part of the meditation for me is to be, to be courageous and be courageous and put your ideas out there and 
the beauty of being an artist, no, no one can say, they can't say nothing to me. <laughs> you can't say nothing to me, I, you know? That's where it lives, and I think that it's part of our responsibility as artists to expand the consciousness of the world. We, don't, we are only as progressive and as imaginative as, like the, as you can, we could perceive, you know what I mean? So it's just like, it's, it's there. Thank you for that question. Um, I would need more time to develop a thoughtful response about where I think the black imaginary is right now. But I can tell you about my grandmother's infinite imagination and how she and her generation uh, thought about it. And that's me. My grandmother had a third grade education. She sharecropped, she sold squirrel stew, she made all of her children's clothes, the tablecloths and the curtains and their dresses all matched. Um, she sold property when she needed money. She grew, she raised hogs, grew sugar cane, all of those things. And every time she got paid, she squirreled away a little bit of money. And she started buying property in the panhandle of Florida in the 40s. That was rare. She walked from Havana, Florida to Tallahassee, Florida. And so when I think about the black imaginary, I think about that infiniteness. Like she didn't actually understand what she was working towards, except she knew that she was working towards liberation for her family, collective liberation for her family. And so when I think about the black imaginary, it actually in involves, it's anchored in liberation and it's anchored in collective work. And so I think about how I'm gonna work collectively for those things that I actually can't even name yet, but knowing that that kind of work will lead to something after me. Um, your question is great. And um, I, I, that, this is hard to follow. Um, so I'm, I wanna be useful to you. Um, so I think, um, I'm going to say this, this is how I dive into when I experience someone else's imagination. Is that something a little bit? Okay. So like the first time I saw, um, Minnie Evans drawings or spaces of place or, um, another one that had me, my mat, like taking leaps and bounds with the artist. Right, so someone like a Toni Morrison and Pilot and and these writings where individuals who are creatives create these. Um, what, what is in the what is in this work? Let me be specific. What is in this work is ideas of cartography, geography, water, language, sound, relationships, intimacy. So I think when I experience a black imagination through artists, most of the time, the structure of the work is, um, is what I'll say, discursive, right? So there's this movement and migration in these structures of storytellings or paintings or sound um, where I get to move between the universe, imagination, clothes, a song, someone else's memory, um, so when I am inside um, the imagination of someone who is black and I am swimming in their imagination and the form that they are presenting this imagination in is structured. So my movement is smooth and graceful and tough and energetic. That's where I, that's why I like to live, right? Where I am diving in 
um, black form, black life form, where these structures of creativity um, and the te technique of these structures allow me um, space of liberation while I'm witnessing or while I'm being in. Does that make sense? It's different. Well, with that, I feel like we have to leave it there. We've got to leave it there because we're over time. But I also think what a, what a beautiful place to leave it because what you've done is, is um, mirrored the experience of your work in this exhibition, which we have the privilege to, to have with us um, for a few more weeks until January 29th. So. I want to thank you, Jamia, Zoe, and Torquase, and invite the audience to thank you as well for sharing your worlds with us. Yes. What a privilege to just live in your orbit. Seriously. Thank you, <laughs> I know. Shout out to Ryan, and thank you so much to. Tracy Beal, Sabina Diaz, and Cynthia Hodgethorne, and the whole BMA team for um, their continued support. So thank you. Have a good night, everyone.